now to our joint Theology on Tap, Politics in a Pint, brought to you by the Eugene J. McCarthy Center for Public Policy and Civic Engagement, and St. John's Campus Ministry, St. Ben's Campus Ministry, and as well as the Intercultural International Student uh, Services. So there's a lot of us. We're all together. But thank you all for coming out. This is going to be a great event. We're going to be talking about how to vote consciously in this upcoming election. Now, we will have some pizza coming out. There was a slight mix-up on the order, so it's getting a little delayed. It'll be out in about 10 minutes. It'll be great. When it does get here, feel free to just get on up, go and grab it. We'll keep this a casual event. We'll get started here. So here we have our moderator, Grant. He'll start, take it away. Thank you, Grant. Happy birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday, Grant. Thank you. Uh, yeah, like he said, my name is Grant Angelo, a political science major, and I will be the moderator this evening to make sure this doesn't get out of my hand. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it won't, but uh, I'd like to introduce my uh, fellow seated folk here. On my right is Professor Whitney Court, who is a political science uh, professor here. Uh, then we have uh, Anne Gleick, who is a student of political science, and uh, her, yeah, that's her major, and her minor in theology, I'm told. Uh, and then on her right, we have Professor uh, Father Nick Becker, uh, who is a professor of moral theology. And then on the very end, we have Professor Kathy Cox, who is another professor of moral theology. Uh, like they said, our topic is voting your conscience in this upcoming election. Uh, as a Catholic Benedictine uh, school, we like to think that we, you know, have some concerns in this election. So we're going to talk about that, and we will start on my right with Professor. Is it on? Yes. Um, I am coming from this. First, I feel like I should apologize uh, for what's happening in the election. That's not normally what we do in political science. Um, so I, I bring kind of the immoral part of the, the table here, the panel, uh, to everyone tonight. So I'm, I'm sorry uh, for that. But um, I'm kind of talking from the perspective of I've been voting the year. And so looking at the Catholic vote, which is actually quite unique, uh, when we look at the, uh, it's a quarter of the population that identifies themselves as Catholics, but there's huge variation across that. So um, about 20% of the ultimate electorate, people taking part in voting, Elections end up being uh, Catholic voters, but within that, there's different topics. So we have um, your white Catholics, we have our uh, minority Catholics, we have Catholics that identify as conservatives and Catholics that identify as liberals. And there's um, actually what ends up shaking down in the last few elections, actually, um, to being a more um, split um, uh, party within. Uh, their party identification. So you can't necessarily say like you can with conservative uh, evangelical voters. You can't necessarily say well they're they're typically Republican. Um, they actually uh, end up being split pretty evenly. Uh, but what's also interesting about Catholic voters is that since 1972 they've always been on the correct side of the elections and they voted for the winners, which is kind of interesting too. So that shows you kind of the swing. But as we see it, the um, the Overall electorate change and shift, uh, especially building minority uh, Hispanic voters, we're seeing that Catholic vote really shift and change, and we can talk more about that as we kind of go through um, this evening to the challenges that, that they face. Wonderful. Uh, if we want, I don't know who would like to go next, if Anne would like, otherwise, we can uh, hear from our moral theologists who might have a perspective on the. Um, Kind of the, the concerns that we have, uh, I know as Catholics, just what kind of uh, rhetoric are we hearing? How does that affect our um, morality? And how should we consider uh, our voting when looking at our current candidates? Um, so kind of whoever whoever's comfortable going next. I'll try. My task this afternoon is this. Uh, the US bishops, every four years uh, for the past several election cycles, 
approve a document called Forming Consciences for Faithful Citizenship. What I want to do with you in about 10 minutes is just take you through a couple items of that document, and then Professor Cox uh, at some point will speak to you focusing specifically on the nature of conscience in terms of uh, voting and what those issues are there. Uh, on October 2nd of this year, Pope Francis was flying back from a trip from Azerbaijan. He's become very famous for giving these rather freewheeling press conferences uh, on his way back from trips. And uh, this particular flight was no different. An American journalist asked this question. The United States are coming to the end of a long presidential campaign. Many American Catholics and people of conscience find it difficult to choose between two candidates who diverge from the teachings of the church. What advice would you give to the faithful in America? Pope Francis said this, during an electoral campaign, I never say a word. The people are sovereign and I would say only, study the proposals well, pray, and choose with your conscience. The US bishops uh, have done us a great favor, done Catholics in this country a great favor by giving us this document which is designed to help us form our conscience so that we may choose well with our conscience. Uh, for the last several election cycles, the US bishops have given us this document. It's a 40-page document that's well worth your time, but we can't do 40 pages in 10 minutes, so I'm just going to give you a few highlights. Uh, Bishop Kettler here in St. Cloud, and actually all of the Minnesota bishops, have pointed to this document as saying, you know, hopefully this will guide the consciences of their faithful within voting. Uh, the 2015 document is described as the 2007 document with limited revisions that are designed to incorporate the later teaching of Pope Benedict and the teaching of Pope Francis uh, to this point in his service as Bishop of Rome. Uh, the bishops say this, in this statement we bishops do not intend to tell Catholics for whom or against whom to vote. Our purpose is to help Catholics form their conscience in accord with God's truth. We recognize that the responsibility to make choices in political life rests with each individual in light of a properly formed conscience, and that participation goes well beyond casting a vote in a particular election. The document is really built around four discrete questions. Why does the church teach about issues affecting public policy? Who in the church should participate in political life? How does the church help Catholic faithful to speak about political and social teachings? And finally, how can Catholic social teaching help guide our participation in elections? First of all, why does the church teach about issues affecting public policy? Well, simply put, participating in shaping the moral character of society is a basic requirement of the Catholic faith. It's a basic part of the mission that is given to us by Jesus Christ. Jesus teaches us to love one another, and we need to bring that truth to political life as people of both faith and reason. As Americans, our tradition of religious pluralism, pluralism is enhanced. It's not limited when religious groups, when people of faith, even people who disagree, bring their convictions to public life, to public, the public square. We should not have to bracket our religious convictions when we speak about issues of public import. The Catholic community in particular brings a consistent and historical moral framework and particularly broad experience serving those in need. Secondly, who in the church should participate in public life? Well, perhaps not a shocker, everybody. Responsible citizenship is a virtue and participation in political life is a moral obligation and faithful citizenship is an ongoing responsibility. It's not something we should just do at a wonderful event like this every four years. Being faithful citizens is something that we do every year and every day. For Catholics, the hope is that we are guided more by our moral convictions than simply attachment to any political party or interest group. Many Catholics in the present environment, perhaps this election cycle more than any other, may feel politically disenfranchised, sensing that no party and few candidates fully share our comprehensive commitment to human life and dignity. Many Catholics have described themselves in this country as politically homeless. We don't have the tradition of a social democratic party, a 
uh, Christian party, which exists in some European countries, Latin American countries. Instead of becoming discouraged, the hope is that Catholic women and men will in fact become more involved, running for office, working within political parties, communicating their concerns to elected officials. In the Catholic mind, uh, political involvement is, is a virtue. Politics is supposed to be a noble vocation, no matter how ugly this election has gotten. Even those who can't vote should raise their voices on matters that affect their lives and the common good. Well, how does the church help Catholic faithful to speak about political and social questions? The well-formed conscience, with which Professor Cox will tell us a great deal about. Also, the virtue of prudence. Simply, what is the good to be done and the evil to be avoided in this particular situation? Prudence help us, helps us to weigh alternatives and to determine what is most fitting to a specific context and then to act. Prudence help us, helps us to apply the other virtues to particular circumstances, particular situations. One basic precept of the moral life is to do good and avoid evil. Catholicism has traditionally thought that there are certain things which must never be done, either by individuals or a society, because they are always incompatible with the love of God and the love of neighbor. Regardless of circumstances or intentions, there are certain acts that are always wrong. Uh, we traditionally refer to these as intrinsically evil acts. Perhaps the most basic act, intrinsically evil act, the intentional taking of innocent human life. When the bishops speak of this, of course, they list abortion as the first thing mentioned under this heading, but they also mention several other things. And it also should be noted that the basic right to life, that respecting life, is linked to other human rights to which everyone needs to live uh, and thrive, such as food, shelter, education, healthcare, meaningful work. A right to life, you might start by talking about abortion, but you're gonna talk about a lot more than abortion before you're through. Uh, the bishops note that there are two temptations when discussing these issues. Uh, first of all, a moral equivalence that will make no ethical distinction between different kinds of issues involving human life and dignity. That the direct and intentional taking of human life uh, from conception until natural death is always wrong and not simply one issue among many. But a second temptation is to misuse those necessary moral distinctions as a way of dismissing or ignoring other serious threats to human life and dignity, including racism, death penalty, unjust war, environmental degradation, unjust immigration policies. The list goes on and on. Well, how can Catholic social teaching help guide our participation in this election? The dignity of the human person is the center of all Catholic moral teaching. That is our sweeping ethical concern. Uh, another principle that the bishops point out, that of subsidiarity. Larger institutions should not overwhelm smaller ones within society. The church's teaching on the importance of the family in family life is often located here. The common good is another basic principle that guides us. The sum total of social conditions which allow people, either as groups or individuals, to reach fulfillment more easily and issues that are dealt with their human rights, the dignity of workers, an economy that serves people and not the other way around, and care for creation. Solidarity, commitment to the good of each person in society, because the moral test of any society is how we treat the weakest members of that society. Finally, uh, there'll be an extensive laundry list in this document uh, applying Catholic teaching to a variety of major issues, human life, peace, marriage and family life, religious freedom, the poor, economic justice, the list goes on and on. But the point I would make is they start by stating general principles and then applying them to specific issues. I guess, the, I mean, the last thing that I would like to say as part of my dog and pony show is this. I mean, just as a voter, I have to say uh, I'm personally vexed in this election there are a couple paragraphs here that I have found helpful. There may be times when a Catholic who rejects a candidate's unacceptable position, even on policies promoting an intrinsically evil act, may reasonably decide to vote for that candidate for other morally grave reasons. 
voting in this way would be permissible only for truly grave moral reasons, not to advance narrow interests or partisan preferences, or to ignore a fundamental moral evil. When all candidates hold a position that promotes an intrinsically evil act, the conscientious voter faces a dilemma. The voter may decide to take the extraordinary step of not voting for any candidate, or after careful deliberation, may decide to vote for the candidate deemed less likely to advance such a morally flawed position and more likely to pursue other authentic human goods. In such a strange election, I find that helpful. Okay. Well, that's a, lot, that's a lot for me to think about as I'm writing notes uh, furiously, uh, but a lot of very good information. Um, so kind of moving from there, um, I know we want to talk about kind of forming conscience, consciences and the nature of conscience, but also uh, I kind of want to hear first what Anne, what you kind of want to focus on. I know as a student of political science and theology, you know, you have, um, you have a different perspective and you have kind of, uh, I think, a perspective similar to many of us. So I guess I kind of want to know uh, first what you kind of are, uh, what ideas you have, and then we'll move on to talk about the nature of consciousness. Awesome. Thank you. So like Grant said, I'm both a student of political science and of theology, which is a great interdisciplinary studies. Uh, if any of you have time to add a major. I, uh, as both a young voter and as a religious voter and as a, um, both a student of political science and theology, I think I have a not necessarily unique perspective but a different perspective um, than maybe some other people. And what I was thinking about when I was preparing for this panel, I was mulling over how I prioritize issues and think about my values when I vote. Um, as a young person, I've only been able to vote in about three elections. My first one was when I was in a senior in high school in 2012 when President Obama was up for re-election and when in Minnesota, if you, you might recall, in 2012, we were voting on two constitutional amendments. Uh, both one to impose a voter ID law in Minnesota and one to uh, define marriage as between one man and one woman. And that was a really interesting time to come of age in the political world. I think as both a religious person and as somebody interested in government and political science. And um, what I come up with is that when I think about how I'm gonna vote on an issue or on a candidate, even in uh, an election as interesting as this one, uh, is that it all comes down to, it has to come down to your values and your morals. And for me, uh, I'm really glad you brought up the Catholic social teachings, because as that was the moral driving force in my life um, up until now and continuing on. Um, and thinking about the Catholic social teachings of caring for creation and the rights and dignities of humans and in, of workers, the call to participation and solidarity with everybody, I think that as a, both a person of political science and a, and a Christian voter, you have to come down to your baseline um, when you're thinking about an issue and how any issue or voter or candidate reflects back on your values. Um, not as detailed as we were able to provide, uh, but I think you have to just measure it as to your call to be an informed voter. And everything is more nuanced than it may seem on television. Um, okay, so moving kind of, we have another perspective that we um, can see. Also, there's pizza. Uh, I've been told, um, very, I'm, I'm all over the place, but you should definitely get pizza if you came primarily for food. Uh, now would be the time. But I imagine none of you came primarily for food because that would be ridiculous. Um, but I think we can continue. Uh, our conversation and kind of focus on this perspective of forming conscience and really what what it means, uh, where consciousness comes from, um, and kind of as a Catholic, uh, how that plays into our behavior and our our thinking about 
you know, our whole life. This can get very, this can get very deep. Whole life? Wow, that's a tall task for a few minutes. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you all for coming. I'd like to thank um, our moderators, Brandon Woodard, um, the Intercultural and International Student Services Director who got us organized, and then our panelists here. Um, I'm really curious um, what else Dr. Whitney Court will say about Catholics, um, because I will tell you, I am not registered in any political party. Um, so I don't know, and I take very seriously that we're not supposed to be partisan, and so that's one of the ways I've thought about how not to be partisan and really make sure I'm thinking about issues and the questions of the common good as a Catholic is to not tie myself to one political party. So you need to know that up front. That's my disclaimer. Um, the selection's hard. I've done this now three times. I came here in 2007, and so this is the third election cycle. Um, and it's a very different one for various reasons. So one of the things in terms of conscience, um, it's very hard to define. Um, you're going to, if you go to scripture, you're going to get plural definitions. If you go to the Catholic documents from the Second Vatican Council, you're going to get plural definitions. So I'd like to just give you um, a quick definition from theologian and sister uh, Ann Patrick, who actually sadly passed away this summer. But she defines conscience as a personal moral awareness experienced in the course of anticipating future situations and making moral decisions, as well as in the process of reflecting on one's past decisions and the quality of one's character. So it's more than just a thing or an aspect of who we are. Her attention to a personal moral awareness means it captures all aspects of who we are. It means when we're thinking about our conscience and forming ourselves as moral agents and thinking about voting, we have to take account our rationality, our, rationality, our reasons, how we might feel, but also then um, just showing up here. When you asked Grant about forming consciences, this is part of it, being in conversation with each other, getting a political science perspective on the issues. One question um, that I'd like to, a couple questions to raise in terms of forming consciences for voting. One question to consider is what are the policy positions of the various candidates? Not just the candidate of your own party, but of the other parties as well. And are they focused on the pursuit of the common good? Questions of mar those mar on the margins? Are they working for the civic good rather than for partisan politics? And that comes right out of the Second Vatican document of Gaudi Met Spes, Church in the Modern World. Civic good, not partisan good. One of the questions, and I know I'm going on long, but I hope you'll bear with me for a moment, that has been raised for me, and I've heard it in numerous places, is how do we deal with the character of our presidential candidates? Um, so I'm focusing there for a moment, even though I think Anne pointed this out well, that we have to, uh, when we vote, we're voting on judicial questions, we're voting on local, state, and federal elections, and we're also voting on amendments in our own state, and so local issues. And so that needs to be part of your consideration before you go to the ballot box as well. But speaking to the presidential election for a moment, I went to the rule of Benedict, um, and so I'm going out on a limb here with our Benedictine colleagues in the room, and looked at the criteria and traits for choosing the abbot and the prioress. So what are leadership qualities? Goodness of life and wisdom of teaching. They must be temperate and merciful. They must not be excitable anxious, extreme, obstinate, jealous, or overly suspicious. They must show forethought and consideration in their orders. They should be discerning and moderate.
Their qualities should include teaching by both words and example, avoiding favoritism, and having the capacity to use various approaches with their monks based on personalities and temper temperaments. So in other words, the capacity to get along with a wide range of people and to work with a wide range of folks. And then finally, for your consideration, um, before I turn it back to our moderator, the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace, in paragraph 410, in the Compendium of the Social Doctrine of the Church, says that those, and this is a quote, with political responsibilities must not forget or underestimate the moral dimension of political representation which consists in the commitment to fully share in the dignity of the people and to seek solutions to social problems. They have to put their power into practice as service and the characteristics they give, patience, modesty, moderation, charity, efforts to share, and authority exercised by persons who are able to accept the common good and not prestige or the gaining of personal advantages is the true goal of their work. So I offer that to you for consideration because I've heard many people ask. I mean, one person's called a liar, the other. I mean, we've heard the name calling back and forth and the questions about virtue and characters of the candidates this season. So I offer that for thinking about formation of voting this season. Um, so it seems to me, um, and I'm not, you know, I'm no, Genius, but uh, it seems to me that the that being a voter is a very uh, challenging job, uh, and being a moral voter is an even more challenging job. Um, and especially having these different perspectives as being Christian or uh, religious and trying to vote and be a responsible citizen, um, you know, while maintaining this personal moral awareness um, is a very challenging thing to do. Um, but we know that you know, our parents and other people have been voting for a long time, and the Catholic vote especially has been a major influence in many elections. Uh, so I guess, uh, to Whitney, do you, what is the impact of the Catholic vote? How have Catholics been engaged as uh, leaders in our, you know, in the legislature, in our uh, executive branch, judicial branch, and kind of, as Catholics, what has the impact been uh, in terms of voting as well? Sure. Well, looking historically, right, uh, going back to like the 1960 elections of the JFK, there was obviously a lot of fear over having a Catholic leader, and the fear surrounded this idea that the Pope would have the ear of our president and would then be able to shape uh, the decisions that the executive makes. Um, and, and that, of course, ended up being not as, as big of an issue at all. Um, people don't even realize that, like, the vice president right now is a Catholic um, and, and uh, is, is a proud Catholic as well. Um, Joe Biden, for anybody who's, who's <laughs> a, a bit of a fan. Um, <laughs> uh, one thing that I want to touch on is, is uh, what, what Kathy Cass said, was that she, she's somebody who, who doesn't want to identify with any particular party. And that is a unique within the, the Catholic grouping, which is um, unique amongst other religions. Uh, you actually see about a third of all Catholics fit this kind of moderate, open to going with the with their conscience. Um, and and that's, that's really interesting. And I think that's why they end up having, because those are spring voters then, that's why they end up having a potentially large impact. That's a big chunk of the electorate. Um, that enough to tip an election if they're, they're voting and thinking, like uh, Kathy just kind of walked us through some of the reasoning um, behind you know, her own kind of thinking and, and that uh, pulling up the, or what they're looking for in, in leadership here. Uh, uh, with the, that's great. Yeah, the two benefits inside, that's fantastic. Um, zing. <laughs> that's the music here. So, um, but yeah, so this is, um, I mean, that really can have a big persuasion a power in within the uh, election, uh, how they end up voting, and in seeing the church um, send out pretty clear signals that we want you thinking about these are the types of moral decisions we want you making uh, when you are, are uh, voting. You know, they can't say who to vote for, of course, um, legally, but uh, they can uh, try to help steer you 
towards thinking about what would be the best moral decisions for you to make. And so that's, um, I, I think Catholic studies definitely have uh, an impact on the So, kind of, I guess going from there, so it will go, obviously legally we cannot, the Catholic Church will not tell anyone specifically who to vote for, but so should as Catholic voters we focus more on the policies that are presented, uh, or not presented perhaps, um, or should we focus kind of on the moral character of the person that we're voting for? Um, because it seems to be that um, there is that there's a divide in the way that many people vote, and that some vote based on who the person is and what their morality is and what it presents, and there are some who vote based on policy like myself. So it's kind of, how do you, how should, or what, I, oh, yeah. I, yeah. So, so yeah, I don't you know think those are necessarily separate, yeah. right? So when you look at somebody and you see the policy decisions that they're making, you're making judgment calls on their character while they're, they're espousing those views. Um, and so, so those aren't necessarily exclusive, right? Um, if you hear that somebody is pro-choice, or you hear that somebody um, is, is um, um, uh, you, you pass a judgment call on their character. Um, either way, depending on how you yourself have been socialized and what your views are. Um, so those aren't necessarily uh, mutually exclusive. Um, we do personality and our judgment of people's character matters tremendously in the decisions that we make. And I think that their policy views and the things that we know about them, how they're behaving uh, within an election, those sorts of things are all things that we take into consideration. And, and that you know, Catholic voters, just like anybody else, uh, treats that um, as something that's quite important to them. So, and could I answer? Yeah. Um, I would agree with. Doctor, in that it's not an either or, um, but following also up on something that Father Nick said is that there is the option to not vote. And um, I have a neighbor who is Catholic and she's given me permission to say this. She typically writes in a candidate so that she can vote down ballot for the presidential. You know, she'll go vote presidential. If she's not happy, she'll write in a name and then continue to vote in our local elections to make sure that her vote is heard there where at the local level she feels it has more of an effect. So those are options as well. Yes, and I've heard a, a, a tremendous amount about that, uh, this election, and not necessarily in past elections quite as much. I think more and more people are, are seeing that abstain, either abstaining or writing in someone else because they can't stomach a vote for either of the candidates. Um, one thing to also mention, and Anne brought this up and Kath brought it up as well, the, um, we're not only voting for the president, there are ample, those of you in my state and local government class right now, there are ample elections that actually greatly influence our lives far more than and have direct contact with us in our everyday lives than the executive, the presidency does. Um, that's obviously where all these 24 seven news channels are, are covering, but those are the things that are critically important for you to understand who you're voting for and what referendums are out there, what politicians are out there. Um, that would take more effort on your part to be an informed and um, you know, conscious voter. That, does, that can be more difficult to be able to find uh, the answers you're looking for in that as you're trying to research that. And oftentimes that information can come out closer to the election too. So I strongly encourage you, um, if you're voting here, uh, to look at you know, St. Cloud Times and places like that that are covering the local elections. If you're still voting back at your, your home, um, uh, make sure that you check the local newspaper. They'll do things like Q and A's with uh, people running for school board, or running for uh, your community uh, little offices, or things that kind of give both sides of an issue that may be important that people are voting on within your communities. I encourage you to actually do the research instead of just checking boxes or leaving them blank when they may actually be quite important uh, issues for your communities. So once again, your job as voters is obviously a very difficult one. There's a lot of research that goes into it on both the moral front and the political front, knowing kind of how these laws affect people and how that um, the Catholic social teachings play into uh, that. So I guess moving on, I don't, I don't exactly know where I want to go um, because we have covered a lot of information in that we we've gained some perspective on. Um, 
from obviously the Catholic vote. We've gained some perspective from our kind of age group and what we think about uh, in the current elections. And then uh, we've heard some uh, ideas about morality and how it comes from the Pope. Um, but is there something else, uh, Anne or um, Father Nick, uh, Nicholas, is there anything kind of uh, that you would want to add in terms of kind of the morality of voting, um, especially focused on the two candidates that we currently have, um, not just in general when we vote, but specifically looking at Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, kind of what kind of, I guess, concerning things should we be thinking about as moral voters? Sorry, that's a very <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I was just told by my esteemed colleague, welcome to be being put on the spot. Um, perhaps the only thing that I could say in direct answer to that question is I really would hope, because I, I mean, I know that there are other kind of homeless Catholics in the electorate, it's not just me. Uh, and I am frankly really disheartened by the pres presidential cycle uh, uh, this time around, uh, both in content and in style of expression. Uh, I was just mentioning before our talk began that I'm just back from finishing graduate studies, and I was in Europe for the past five years, and four of those five years were in Rome. And uh, with Europeans, and I don't mean to pick on one candidate, but I'm about to, uh, Europeans would come up to me and asked me to explain Donald Trump to them. Uh, uh, just people couldn't understand. Uh, and I tried to say, well, he's kind of like Silvio Berlusconi. He's kind of like the American Berlusconi. Or, and some people would say, well, wasn't there already a President Clinton? Uh, uh, and yes, yes, I mean, there was. Uh, so I guess, I mean, to directly answer your question, if there are other people who are struggling with the top of the ticket, I just personally really hope that it wouldn't stop people from voting or really wouldn't stop people from tuning out of the process. I think it's easy to get cynical, I think it's easy to get discouraged, but if you're not happy with the way that politics are going at some level, it's just more incentive to get involved. I would just echo what um, Father Nick has said and what Dr. Ford has already um, said, that even if you don't like uh, Secretary Clinton or um, Donald Trump, or you've already accepted that your candidate might lose the election. There's a real importance of voting for your House candidates and your Senate candidates and uh, city council races and county commissioner races that uh, Dr. Ford already said that your state and local governments have a really dramatic impact on your everyday life. And that your, how the House and the Senate um, on the national level have a real impact on policy um, in conjunction with the president. So I would really urge you to not sit it out not just give up because of the top of the ballot, because the rest of it's really important. And if you're from Minnesota and you're interested to see what's on your ballot, you can go to mnvotes.org and view your ballot. You can see who your us in your city council races and the constitutional amendment that you're voting on, and uh, the deadline to register to vote in Minnesota is Tuesday the 18th. Um, up until that day, you can register to vote online or in person. Um, and if you miss that deadline, you can vote on election day and register on election day on campus. Wonderful. Yeah, I was just going to say, make sure you register. Uh, we're going to move on to some questions, I believe. Um, I think we've kind of, we've covered kind of our areas and we'll see what kind of questions we draw from you guys. Um, and so if there is anyone with a question, uh, or if you would like more pizza or anything, you should do that now. But. Um, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, uh, Peter will walk around, he will hand you a microphone, and you will be able to address uh, any of these wonderful panelists except me, because I don't know any. Any questions? Um, somewhat recently, Tim Kaine has been accused of not being a real Catholic by the Trump campaign. Um, what do you make of that? And can you give an example of um, a historical real Catholic or in a press? <laughs> <laughs> Who are you asking? <laughs> Anyone on the panel that wants to take the question? <laughs> I guess 
esteemed colleague is passing to me, but I will let the others. To frame the question, I'm going to, I'm struggling with the way the question's been framed. Um, because given the fact that for Catholic voters, there's a wide range of issues that need to be considered, and that Father Nicholas did mention that are listed also in faithful citizenship, and if we go back to the scriptures, there's even more than just a number of issues. There's concern for widows, there's concern for housing. Um, the prophet Habakkuk, or Obadiah, goes after um, the question of the fact that they're killing each other, that like there's war happening between bands of people who have historically been connected to each other. Um, so there's a whole swath of issues, and so there's never going to be one candidate who fully embodies all of Catholic teaching, just like there's no Catholic themselves who will ever fully embody all of Catholic teaching. Um, so to your question about um, Vice Presidential Candidate McCain, or Cain, if you look at particular issues, he's going to fall short. And yet on other issues, he's actually very strong. So it goes back to, I think, I'd like to hear what Anne has to say, because it, goes to, it seems to be her, her comment about how do you weigh which issues you're going to prioritize. So that's how I would answer your question. I'm going to toss this one to Dr. Court, actually. <laughs> Um, well, I think what he's, uh, what Trump is accusing Tim Keene of being is not being that white Catholic conservative, which is only a quarter of the Catholic community. Um, and I think that what he's doing there is he's um, not understanding what Catholics are uh, when he's making that charge. So in, in where that charge is coming from, so everybody knows in the room, um, he's somebody who is, um, is personally pro-life, but when it comes to creating policy, he um, doesn't feel like it's his role as a policymaker to, um, to, to stand in, in the way of a woman's right to choose. Uh, also, in the state of Virginia, they have the death penalty, and there have been times where he's had to um, abide by uh, the, the current law, the structure, um, and the court system in making that decision. So he has, um, as a governor, you have the power to, to uh, stop that from decided to defer to the legal system um, and, and respect that. Um, so I think that's where Trump is coming from by saying uh, not a good enough Catholic. Um, but that being said, that's simply, a, you know, we have liberal Catholics, but we also have moderate Catholics. So, so it's not understanding, really, uh, what the Catholic faith uh, and what Catholic voters do and are when they come. May I add something? I was just going to say, I, I think it's unhelpful to label people. I mean, I, I, I just don't think that's a helpful or charitable thing to do. What I do think is helpful is I remember when Tim Kaine uh, made remarks, I think, about uh, the Catholic Church will evolve in its position on same-sex marriage. He said something like that. Uh, the Catholic Diocese of Richmond then put out a statement not mentioning Tim Kaine by name and just gently restated what the church believes and what the church teaches. Uh, I think that's a better and more charitable approach than labeling people. Uh, hello, good. All right, so there's a lot of discussion about Catholic, Catholic voters, Catholic church. I didn't see anything about the word Catholic in the promotion, so I'm wondering about other religions. They exist. <laughs> that That's not a true-false question. That was not what I was told to prep for. No, uh, but what we see with other religions, and, and they are, you know, a, a, obviously a huge part of um, the electorate as well, um, right? Like the other 80% of voters are, are um, other religions uh, that the evangelical vote we hear a lot about. They tend to be more of a conservative block of voters um, that you see the Republican Party try to pursue more and to figure out how they're going to mobilize and motivate those especially in this election. Um, so where they don't really necessarily um, ideologically or behavior-wise agree with the Republican candidate, um, that's going to be a hard one, too. We're going to see um, the potential for, for a, a drive-down in turnout in some of these areas. Uh, we also see the Protestant vote. There's 
huge variation across that. It's obviously still, that's a very diverse group as well. Um, and you see other kind of smaller groups um, uh, within the, um, you know, small religious groups too, you know, Jews and Muslims and things like that. Um, and, and that tends to be, you know, they might go a little bit more conservative and things like that too, but again, you get very uh, It's just, I think, with a Catholic vote, it's like, a fifth of the voters. Um, so that's where we have the potential to have it be such a powerful swing vote. Um, and, and that's what I was told to prep. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I can answer more specific questions about that too if people have them. Um, and I would add, at least in terms of formation of conscience for voting, a lot of what I have, what's in here in terms of other areas, applies across more than just, it would apply for, I would say, all voters, whether there are other religious denominations, uh, Christian denominations, religious tradition, atheists, agnostics, because some of the listing is that to recognize that we're in relationship with each other, so there's a pursuit of, the, of what's good for the civic community as a whole, need, the need to be responsible in the way one votes. And so what does that responsibility look like? A recognition that one needs to, um, <coughs> study, fact check, know the issues, be in conversation with people who might know more than you do about an issue to inform yourself. Um, and so those are recognition of the need for ourselves to identify our own blind spots um, in terms of seeking the truth, a willingness to work across lines and for information and decision making. So I, those are some of the things that I would have said earlier too, that I think cross and transcend just the Catholic vote. And I think in, I just, I don't know why I'm adding, I'm not, you know, but um, I think also just the, when you think about consciousness, and I know, you know, from the perspective that we're on a Catholic campus, where, you know, the focus was intended for that, but when you think about consciousness, it's not like there is not conscience formed around other issues, you know, the uh, religious meaning or the theological meaning behind the morality that you have for those who do not have that uh, in their life, you know, especially if you think about uh, the Latino vote, especially in California, is very influential and they've historically been influenced by uh, Catholic teaching, but it's changing very much based on the uh, political issues that they've dealt with there. And so based in race and gender as well, there are, you know, that extends how you form your conscience. So I guess there's, you know, there is more to forming a conscience than just your religious um, thought. But is there anyone else who has a question? Yes, we have one more back. Hello. Uh, I would like to preface my question with the fact that I know that the Catholic Church cannot offer specific support for one particular candidate. But with that said, my question is more aimed at the theological side of the panel. And my question is, do you feel that there is a good moral choice being proposed by one of the major political party candidates. Also, how important is it to vote for a candidate who is morally clean? Help, help me with the first, do I think that one of the parties is providing a good moral choice? Yes. That, that, the question is, do you feel as if one of the I mean, one of the parties is providing a good moral choice, or as if there is a correct moral option. Among the two candidates? Is there... Among is the, the major party candidate. Among the major party candidates? Is there... <coughs> well, I'll, I'll say two things just speaking personally as, as, as a voter who happens to be a Catholic, because I voted in every presidential election since 1996. The first thing I would say is that I've never really been happy with who I voted for. I've never been truly enthusiastic, and I think every other time I, I voted for one of the major party candidates at the top of the ballot. The other, but I've never really been excited about it. Uh, the other thing I would say is that, so I've actually des decided to vote absentee in Minnesota, just because it's easier to fill that, and it's now easier to do that in Minnesota, by the way. Uh, it was tough in the past, but now it's easier. I already have my ballot. Uh, I haven't decided who I'm going to vote for, but I have decided that I cannot in good conscience vote for either of the major candidates. Um, so, I mean, but beyond that, I mean, that's not a personal endorsement or lack of one or saying that someone else's conscience might not reach a different conclusion. 
I'm just sharing that's where I'm at. And I wasn't laughing at your question. I was chuckling because I'm doing a series of these, and so I actually am going to abstain from answering the first question of if I, in terms of my own feeling, um, so that I can maintain what I need to do here. But I was also laughing about: um, is it important to vote for a candidate that's morally clean? And I'm not sure what you mean by morally clean. Um, but if we mean somebody who, using theological language, never sins to use more political link of never makes mistakes, we'll never have anybody in elected office, is my perspective on the question. So it seems to me that it goes back to what has already been said, is how are you, which characteristics of leadership are you looking for, which values are you going to prioritize? Um, because everyone will fall short if they have to be 100% morally clean would be the way I would answer that for you. So are you going to be able to say that some are probably better than others? I would say yes, but different people are going to come up with different answers to that question based on how they prioritize particular issues and values. Here we go. Um, Thank you guys so much for coming out. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. Um, so my question I think is along the lines of the previous question. Um, and I just wanna thank all of you for coming in and bringing your unique perspective and helping me think through some things in different ways. Uh, I think I come in personally with a, a unique perspective as an evangelical Christian and also someone who's going to be a future high school history and government teacher in the public schools. Um, so those, um, so that's kind of forming my perspective, both of those definitely. Um, and so my question is I'm wrestling through a lot of issues concerning um, poverty and caring for the poor and immigration and, and welfare and uh, all these different things. Um, one of my main issues, of course, is the issue of abortion. And we kind of have been talking about um, the policy uh, versus the character of the candidate. Um, and so I've been thinking through and having discussions. Um, does someone who is adamantly pro-life, like me, um, how do they wrestle through voting um, for someone with character, like Donald Trump, even though his policies would appoint pro-life Supreme Court justices? Um, and so what are some of the things you've heard or moral arguments that you've thought through um, that could help me and others think through, kind of weighing those uh, two things as someone who doesn't have the character I would like him to have, but is seeming to implement policies that's going to protect unborn life. This isn't a moral argument at all. I would just remind everybody that before a Supreme Court justice is appointed, they have to be confirmed by the Senate. And if you're worried about who you're voting for, you should be also worried about who is in the Senate and who is going to be confirming those Supreme Court justices. And if you can't find yourself to vote for a presidential candidate of moral character or of a particular policy, then you have to focus down to get more. But I don't have a moral answer for you at all. I'll take a stab. I mean, I, I think that you need to make, I think Professor Cox's last answer was kind of leading towards this. I think you need to make a proportionate judgment uh, to say that uh, if you ind indeed believe that a particular candidate is going to appoint Supreme Court justices of whom you approve, uh, uh, and that is the highest value for you, then you'd need to make relative decisions about, you know, what are the other policies of the particular candidate, what is the character of the candidate, that it's a serious, it's making a weighted decision. And uh, one of the terms that we've used in, within the Catholic moral tradition is it's a prudential judgment. And nobody can do that for you. That uh, uh, you can participate in events like this, you can have conversations with people you trust, but at the end of the day, it's a judgment that you're going to have to make. And I'll just add one last thing. Um, and this came up in class last week. Um, 
this quite, uh, question similar to this. And one of the things that we discussed in class is what is all captured in the term pro-life? Because life is broader than just the question of abortion. And so the other thing to maybe consider um, in terms of this question is what policies do the candidates have in place to support life that's already born? So children, families, college students, migrants, immigrants, you know, those who are disabled and can't work right now. So what are the other policies that foster life in its breadth? Um, not, you know, beyond the, if that's what you're struggling. So maybe look at the coalition of policies around questions of life. Next question. Okay, so my question is for the entire panel, but mainly geared towards the theology side first. Um, so in Catholic teaching, we're told we need to live out our Catholic values and beliefs in all that we do in our lives. Uh, as a politician, a person who holds office and happens to be Catholic, how does that play into it? Especially in our representative democracy, if you are representing a district or a state or even a nation that you know, your viewpoints, your beliefs aren't held by the majority of people. So in that case, um, are you to impose your uh, religious views through your policy or are you supposed to act as a representative of the people for the people? It's an excellent question. And it's one that really, you know, I'm not the pastor of any politician right now. I mean, I think those are the, those are the sorts of contexts under which those conversations occur. Uh, I would just say two things, that if somebody's elected to represent the people, you're elected to represent the people. But also, in running for office, you need to make clear who you are and what your convictions are. And although polit uh, politics is unjustly slandered and given a dirty name, but I think there are politicians of integrity, and politicians of integrity will say, a politician of integrity will say what she thinks. And I fully expect that what she thinks will be influenced by her religious and moral convictions. Not just her religious and moral convictions, but surely that. And I would expect that as a Catholic politician just as easily as I would expect that uh, for a politician from any other or no religious tradition. And I'll go a little more theoretical and say that um, the document of religious liberty from the Second Vatican Council indicates that um, one has to be mindful of the right to practice one's religion across. And so, and the United States does not have a state religion, and that's, and the politicians can, I'm solid ground here. And so, as Catholic politicians need to be mindful of that as well. Um, but the other element of the Catholic tradition is that it never imposes its belief on other people. It never imposes, but instead tries to say, here's what we offer, and then have to foster a rational understanding and say, here's why you could, this makes sense, and this is a better alternative. And so there's an attempt to always bring faith and reason together. So are, is your reasoning for your belief rational, and can you use it to, pers can it, is it persuasive? That's the word I was looking for. Thank you for letting me stumble through that. No, I think this is something that uh, Catholics in office or anyone with religion in office has to try to struggle with and balance. Um, how much of uh, their role are they going to see as a delegate, um, as somebody who represents their people, and how much are they going to see their, their role as being a trustee, somebody that's been trusted to uh, learn the issues and make uh, valid decisions based off of their own judgment. Um, that's something that they're always struggling with finding a balance on, um, regardless. And, and, and those decisions are going to come from a variety of things. Religion, for some people, is going to be a, a large component of that. Um, for other people, it may be other life experiences that they bring to the table. Um, so, so that's something that, that you do see the struggle with. Um, you see some, again, you know, your, your campaigns and people like that, saying, you know, I have different personal moral convictions, um, but I have to serve this in this capacity as somebody representing a larger, broader uh, electorate. 
constituencies. So that's, that's always a struggle and that's something that there is no right answer to. Um, that's a personal decision on the, the part of the people around. Another question? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we've talked a lot about tonight the two different candidates that we have. <laughs> we've talked a lot about the two different candidates that we have and the two different parties that are being represented. And I guess my question is, is directed more towards the political side of the table, but it's mainly the idea of how you guys, how you both think uh, a third party candidate would be represented. In this election, more than any other, I believe, this is, this is a question that should be asked, is do you really believe that voting for a third party candidate, who you believe is more morally you know, valid, is a better idea than choosing from two candidates who could be seen as both more morally invalid, and if that's still a valid way to use your vote? Um, I do not try to steer people towards voting in any particular way. Uh, that's, that's simply not my job. Right? Um, I have my own uh, decision making that I go through and that own, my own process that I go through um, and, and I wouldn't tell somebody else what their process needs to look like. Um, that being said, um, we know that there's, um, you know, Dubrige's law, he, he mumbled to me or, uh, previously uh, to that, um, it comes to mind. So we do have a two party system. Um, we don't have the types of options that we have that are viable options for the presidency. Um, given our electoral system. That being said, um, if you still want to feel good about yourself and how you vote, um, you know, I, I, I encourage you to look into what all options are, are on the table. If that means not voting because you simply can't find somebody that you can get behind, um, you know, I, I think what we see is people doing things like saying, you know, I was a Bernie Sanders supporter. Bernie Sanders, the Democratic Socialist, build a stronger government so that we can support people, and then saying that they're all of a sudden, all of a, sudden a, a libertarian um, is, is strange to me. Those are, those are actually different things, right? Um, and, and so, so those sorts of things, just because it's an alternative, doesn't mean it's a better alternative and that it, it actually um, aligns with you and who you are. So, so that's why you hear people saying, I'm writing somebody in, or I'm abstaining from voting at the presidential level, I will vote for these other offices, because I simply, again, can't stomach a vote for the, the top two people at the ticket or um, don't feel that somebody else aligns with me. Um, that's a, a decision that each individual has to make. Um, and it has to also, when you see people, there's a lot of voting in this election that is actually against the opponent uh, on both sides, right? Um, so people are voting in a way as to prevent someone else from gaining uh, the power of the executive. I'm pretty sure that's going to be half the country when that happens. So, well, yeah. and, and that's a decision that people, again, have to, have to take into consideration. If they feel that one side, either side, is, is catastrophic, um, they, you do see uh, extremely high unfavorability scores for both of these candidates. Um, so you see people uh, making those, those um, charges, those decisions to vote also against someone, which is no way to, to kind of lead somebody into the presidency. They go and make positive change. Um, it's, it's, um, it's almost sad. Yeah. We do have another question in the back. Yeah, my question <clears throat> actually piggybacks on some things that have been said already. Um, the, the ethicist will be familiar with the distinction between the ethics of intention and the ethics of responsibility. That the ethics of intention, this comes from Max Weber, uh, is that you are responsible for the integrity and purity of your intentions. And if you, if you act in accordance with the integrity of your intentions, you are not responsible for the consequences. Weber describes the ethics of responsibility that if you act in such a way, or, or fail to act in such a way, that a certain outcome comes about that you could have prevented, had you not, had you acted, you are responsible for those consequences, even if they were contrary to what you wanted. So, suppose you feel that you, you can't uh, fully support either candidate. You consider one candidate to be bad and the other candidate to be far worse. If you don't vote for either, because your integrity will not allow you to vote for any candidate that you consider bad, are you then 
morally responsible for the far worse outcome. Martin Luther King Jr. would say yes. He said sitting on the fence in a time of needing, there are times when we cannot be lukewarm. And so Martin Luther King Jr. would ask, is this a time when we cannot be lukewarm? And so he would say, yes, you are responsible if you don't vote. I would think, I mean, I'm extrapolating from something else he said, but. I think it's an excellent question. Uh, but circumstances are always going to matter in that instance. It all matters what state you're in, uh, it seems to me, in terms of making a prudential judgment regarding voting. Uh, uh, one of the swing states would matter much more than I think a state that is reliably one or the other. That's one of the decisions people have to make, right? And, and you see people tracking things like uh, I-38 uh, to see how much of I was talking with a student the other day in my office, and he said that he wasn't uh, thrilled with his choices. Um, he, he was trying to figure out what to do, uh, and it, it was making that, that very kind of calculation. He said, I will wait until we get closer to election day to see which way, because right now Minnesota seems pretty, pretty solidly blue. Um, if that stays the case, um, then I'll go ahead and um, you know, vote for the third party. Uh, and if it doesn't, then I'll reconsider. Um, that being said, that's a huge gamble, right? Um, because these polls give us some sort of a sense for how people say they're going to vote and whether or not they're going to vote. We don't know. So voter turnout is such a gamble. Playing that game scares me, right? I'm doing that poll like, well, I looked at some polls, and uh, I think I'm just going to vote this. I, I, I think that that is something that, um, because we don't know who's actually going to be mobilized, who's going to be um, uh, willing to go out to the polls on that given day, and we don't know how things necessarily are, are going to turn out. And, and, and so that, that is, is, a, is a calculated risk um, and something that I think is, is, could potentially be ended. I know people, for example, that voted independent when Al Franken was running, and then they're like, oh crap, if I had known, I mean, the lesser are two evils, I would have gone with, with know, whichever side, um, but, uh, you know, I didn't, and then there was a recount that was drawn out, and, and, and Frank and obviously uh, barely won in that case. So, um, you know, those sorts of things, you never know how things are going to turn out, so playing that game is, is potentially dangerous. Do we have any other questions? We Hi, thank you all so much. Um, I was having a conversation with my brother recently who's a college student, he's 22, and he was saying he's probably not gonna vote because he doesn't feel informed on the issues, he doesn't feel like he knows enough about it. And um, I look at him and I say, you're smart, you're talented, you're involved in your local community, you know a lot about the world, go vote, you have to vote. So what would you say if there, to anyone that's, what would you say to my brother or to anyone in the audience who feels like they don't know enough about the issues, they didn't read enough articles, they don't really know how taxes affect their lives, um, what would you say to that 20-year-old? Uh, well, we're never gonna have perfect information when we're voting. Um, you can only do the best that you can, given uh, what you know. That being said, um, you know, every four years, I think it's our responsibility as citizens uh, to try to get ourselves a little bit informed. That's how a democracy is uh, created and thrives and is, is, stays healthy, is if we are informed and are making decisions that, you know, like, like we've been discussing uh, today, that are thoughtful, informed decisions. Um, that's not asking that much of people. Um, and, and, and you might actually, what I find when, when students say things like that, like, I think I know enough about this. When I ask them a few questions, they actually do, right? And, and I'll ask them about things like, well, what issues are important to you? And then when you start asking them more questions, they're able to answer them. And, and they're doing that in a sincere way. I think they have this pedestal of somebody who's the informed citizenry um, that is unrealistic. Uh, and, and really what we need to do is understand that we're fitting within our everyday lives. You, you, your brother is a college student, so he's probably a senior. He's probably worried about what his career is going to look like, and if he's going to write his thesis, and if he's ever going to finish it. She's in my thesis class right now, so I can, I can laugh at her expense. But, but um, you know, he's got other things he's worried about. He's always going to have those things. But he's always going to have the responsibility of trying to create a better community.
community and a better society around them as well. And you can begin to take part in that. You know, voting is one way that we do that. You know, it sounds like he's very engaged in other ways, and that's fantastic. Um, voting is kind of your entryway into participation. Um, and, and so it's, it's extremely critical that, that you um, take that role seriously and that you um, are able to see that as one way that you can have an impact for the next few years and beyond. Um, and, and it's something that takes, you know, now with the internet, you can sit down in a couple hours um, and, and be very well informed. Just by clicking around and they have these telephones now even that you can read articles on. It's amazing, right? So, so these sorts of things are, are we're doing it anyway. Um, uh, you know, we're doing these things anyway. It's just a matter of, of recognizing that we're actually doing it. Um, so, yeah, just talk to him a little bit more about uh, his own views and things like that, and I think that you'll find that he's far more informed uh, than he thinks he is. One more question. So you guys have talked a little bit about the resources that are available for voters who want to become informed. Can you tell some of the students in the audience what are some resources you like to use when you're looking at, um, whether it's moral candidates or just getting more informed about the issues you have resources you like to go to? Uh, Dr. Court already mentioned this, but for finding out about local elections, um, local newspapers are really valuable. Um, they, like, they cover local elections like city council races and county commissioner races and school board races. Um, maybe not as extensively as I could, but um, up until the election, especially as it gets closer, um, your local newspaper, um, the St. Cloud Times or wherever you're from is gonna have great information. Also, if you go to places like Minnesota Public Radio, if you're um, in Minnesota or on the national level, obviously there are more resources, um, other newspapers, other um, sites, the League of Women Voters um, maintains a database um, of local elections and more national elections and um, candidate positions. Um, really just toss in a Google search and you're gonna find a myriad of things. So. And it's my understanding that the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan group, so. It is. They're great. <laughs> if you go to vote411.org, um, is the, uh, their database of uh, election races. The other thing I like to do is, and it's hard with the presidential election because this, this time around, because Donald Trump doesn't have a legacy of public service, but with the vice presidential candidates, both having served in the Senate, you can actually go in and look at how they voted on different issues. And that is one of the things I like to do, is go and see how people who've been in office have voted on particular issues in the past. What bills have they supported? And that's a great source of information very quickly. The Minnesota Catholic Conference will feature information not only on the top of the ticket, but also positions that different candidates in Minnesota are taking uh, down ballot that may be of interest. Um, and I would just like to say that the McCarthy Center sends out emails a lot, and you might get them once in a while. Um, and the other night we had a, a candidate forum at South that was about our local uh, candidates that are running for districts around here. Uh, so we do also do that. And then um, political science friends that you have, we're nerds. We tend to talk about this stuff all the time. So if you ever have questions about that kind of stuff, we, at least I try to provide a very unbiased and just as much information as I can because I read this stuff for fun. So um, look for those types of people that you know as well. Um, is there any other questions uh, in the audience? Otherwise, Peter, do you want me to wrap it up? Because I can do that. I have a whole spiel that I just planned in my head a little bit ago. Please do. Um, so I just wanted to thank uh, all of our sponsors for coming. I wanted to thank you guys for coming out. I wanted to thank uh, the people that are sitting at this table with me um, for being intelligent and you know being very thoughtful. Uh, and I um, just want to thank all of you once again for coming here, eating pizza, enjoying, and really um, putting yourselves out there and forcing yourselves to think a little bit more. Um, and tonight, I hope you are able to fall asleep while trying to think about all of these things that we've heard tonight because I can guarantee you it will be a challenge. Um, but otherwise, you guys have a wonderful rest of your night.